All right, so we've got this research paper, Finance Without Exotic Risk. It's a fascinating deep dive into how the stock market works, especially when it comes to the idea of risk. Yeah, it really challenges some of the traditional thinking. Like the whole efficient market hypothesis. Exactly. That idea that stock prices already reflect all the information out there. So any differences in returns should theoretically come down to risk, right? Yeah. The higher the risk, the higher the potential return. Yeah, and researchers have spent decades trying to find those specific risk factors that explain why some stocks do better than others. Right. It's like the quest for the holy grail of finance. But this paper throws a curveball into that whole idea. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. It suggests maybe risk isn't the whole story. Yeah, it proposes that maybe we've been overemphasizing risk and that a big part of those performance differences comes down to, well, expectations. Expectations. What if it's less about how risky a company actually is and more about how optimistic or pessimistic people are about its future earnings? Okay, that's intriguing. But how do you measure something as intangible as expectations? That's where this research gets really clever. They introduce this concept called expectations-based returns, or EBRs. Imagine stripping away all the risk associated with a stock and just focusing on how people's beliefs about its future earnings are affecting its price. So, like, isolating the expectations variable. Exactly. And to do that, the researchers used a clever trick. Analyst forecasts. You mean those predictions Wall Street analysts are always making about companies' future earnings? Precisely. It's like taking the market's temperature in terms of optimism or pessimism. Interesting. So they're using analyst forecasts as a sort of proxy for overall market sentiment. Exactly. And they apply this EBR concept to try and explain some of the classic puzzles in finance, like the value premium. Ah, yes, the value premium. That's the idea that stocks with a high book-to-market ratio the so-called value stocks, tend to outperform growth stocks over the long run. Yeah. But I always thought that was because value stocks were considered riskier, so investors demanded a higher return to compensate. That's the traditional explanation, yeah. But here's where it gets interesting. What this paper found is that when you factor in those EBRs, the need for a risk premium to explain the value premium pretty much disappears. Really? So maybe value stocks aren't actually riskier it's more about how people perceive them. That's what the data seems to be saying. The market isn't necessarily seeing value stocks as inherently riskier, but rather analysts are just more optimistic about the future earnings of growth stocks. So maybe they're getting a little caught up in the excitement of the next big thing. Maybe so. It seems like those expectations can really influence how the market values different types of companies. It makes you wonder how many other stock market anomalies might actually be explained by this same phenomenon. It definitely raises some interesting questions, but hold on, I know what you're thinking. Couldn't this whole thing be a self-fulfilling prophecy? Exactly. If analysts are all bullish about growth stocks, wouldn't that naturally drive their prices up, making it seem like they have higher returns? Right, and if that were true, those EBRs wouldn't be very meaningful. So how do they address that? They actually dug into the data and found that analyst forecasts aren't just reacting to price trends, they're actually leading them. So they're forming their own independent opinions about future earnings. And those opinions are actually moving the market. It seems so. They're not just passively following the herd. Okay, that makes sense. But let's move beyond just average returns for a second. The paper also talks about the whole issue of predictability in the market, right? Specifically, the predictability of return spreads the difference in returns between different types of stocks, like value versus growth. Right. And this is where the efficient market hypothesis starts to break down a little bit. Remember, if everyone was perfectly rational and all information was instantly reflected in prices, there shouldn't be any way to predict future EBRs. We should just see random fluctuations. It's not what they found. Not exactly. The paper actually shows that what people were predicting in the past, what we call lagged expectations, actually has a pretty strong ability to predict future returns. So there's a pattern there, like the market has a memory? Almost. 
It's as if the market is remembering the mistakes people made in their previous predictions. Could you give us an example of how that plays out in the real world? Sure. Think about the dot-com bubble back in the late 1990s. The dot-com bubble. Analysts were super optimistic about those internet companies, remember? I do, I do. But, as we all know, that bubble eventually burst. And what this research suggests is that those overly optimistic expectations from the past actually foreshadowed the underperformance of many of those dot-com darlings in the years that followed. So it was like a correction, the market realizing it had gotten a little ahead of itself. Exactly. It's a fascinating insight into how those expectations can really drive market swings. And it suggests that maybe, just maybe, the market isn't as perfectly efficient as we once thought. This is pretty mind-blowing stuff. It really makes you think differently about risk and return. Before we move on, though, I'd like to get your take on one more point. If we're shifting away from these purely risk-based explanations, how do we start to make sense of what's driving the market? What are the forces at play? Well, that's a great question, and one that this paper doesn't claim to have all the answers to. Fair enough. It definitely highlights the importance of expectations. But we still have a lot to learn about how those expectations are formed, how they ripple through the market, and how they ultimately move those prices up and down. So we're just at the beginning of a whole new journey into the world of behavioral finance, where psychology and economics collide. I think that's a great way to put it. This research really opens up a whole new set of questions about how human behavior is interwoven with the markets. It's a powerful reminder that investors aren't always the perfectly rational beings that economic models often assume. And that understanding those human quirks and biases might be the key to understanding the market itself. Absolutely. And that's what makes this research so exciting, is pushing us to think beyond those traditional models and to explore new frontiers in finance. And it's not just about the value premium, you know. This research also takes aim at the size premium. Oh, right. The idea that smaller companies tend to do better than larger ones over time. I always figured that was because smaller companies were just, well, riskier. Yeah, that's the classic thinking. But this paper's findings, they suggest that a big chunk of that size premium, well, it might also be tied to those expectations we were talking about. You mean like analysts are just more optimistic about those smaller companies, even if their actual performance doesn't always live up to the hype? Exactly. It's almost like they're consistently overestimating the growth potential of those smaller companies. And those inflated expectations, well, they can lead to inflated prices and this illusion of higher returns. So it's kind of the same story as the value premium. Overly optimistic expectations skewing things. It seems that way. And it makes you wonder, right, how many other so-called market anomalies might actually be explained by the same phenomenon? Maybe we've been attributing too much to risk when really it's all about psychology. That's a fascinating thought. So the researchers, they don't just stop at the value and size premiums, do they? Nope. They keep going. They even look at things like a company's investment levels, its profitability, and even momentum. Well, hold on. Let's take those one at a time. First up, investment. What do they find about the relationship between how much a company invests and how well its stock does? Well, traditionally, companies that are investing a lot, they're seen as riskier because they're putting more capital at stake. But this paper, once again, it finds that when you consider those expectations, those EBRs, the need for a risk premium to explain the performance of those high investment companies, well, it kind of shrinks. So maybe those companies aren't actually riskier. Maybe analysts are just, I don't know, more excited about their growth prospects, even if those prospects don't always pan out. Yeah, it's like the market might be pricing in a level of growth that just isn't realistic. Okay, that makes sense. But what about profitability? Surely companies with higher profits are, you know, less risky. They should have higher valuations, right? Logically, yes. But even with profitability, this paper, it throws us another curveball. It finds that those expectations, those pesky EBRs, they still matter, even for profitable companies. It seems those companies with high profits, their stock prices can get inflated by those expectations of continued strong performance. So even the good companies can get caught up in the hype. It seems so. No company is immune to the power of expectations, it seems. Wow, this is really turning everything on its head. Let's tackle momentum. That one always seemed kind of mysterious to me. Momentum, huh? The idea that stocks going up tend to keep going up. Some say it's purely behavioral, like investors just following the herd. But others think, well, maybe there's some hidden risk factor we haven't figured out yet. So what does this paper have to say about momentum? Well, get this. It suggests that momentum might actually be more about, you guessed it, 
expectations than risk. Really? Yep. They find that stocks with strong recent performance, they tend to have higher EBRs, meaning analysts are basically extrapolating that past performance into the future thinking, well, if it's gone up this much already, it's got to keep going, right? But, but we all know past performance isn't always a guarantee of future returns. Are you saying momentum is driven by like a collective overconfidence? That's certainly a possibility. It seems both investors and analysts, they can get a little carried away by a hot stock. They project that upward trend further than it might actually go. And then, well, when those expectations don't pan out, that's when the momentum can reverse. It's amazing how much this changes how we think about the market. So if all these traditional risk factors aren't the whole story, then what is? What's the new framework for understanding how the market moves? Well, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? This paper highlights that expectations are crucial, but it doesn't give us all the answers. We still need to figure out how those expectations are formed, how they spread throughout the market, and how they ultimately cause those price changes. So we're just at the beginning of a whole new chapter in finance, where psychology takes center stage. I think so. It's an exciting time to be studying the markets because it's becoming clear that investors, they aren't always those perfectly rational actors that classic economic theory assumes. And understanding those human quirks, the biases, the emotions, that's the key to understanding the market itself. Absolutely. And that's what makes this research so compelling. It's pushing us to go beyond those old models and explore new frontiers in finance. That's really powerful. Mm. So if we're moving away from thinking about risk in the traditional way, if it's not just about risk, then what does this mean for investors? Should we just toss out all our risk models? Focus only on managing expectations. This paper shows how important it is to understand not just the risk of a company, but also the risk that our own perceptions about that company might be wrong, you know, skewed by our biases and expectations. So it's like there's two layers of risk. The actual risk of the company itself and then the risk that we misunderstand that risk because of our own subjective views. It's a lot to think about. Where do we go from here? What are the big questions this research leaves us with? Well, the paper points to two really important questions. First, how do expectations get so aligned across investors, especially for companies with certain characteristics like those value stocks we talked about? What creates that shared optimism or pessimism? It's like the market creates a story about those types of companies and those stories they can be incredibly powerful, even if they're not always grounded in reality. Yeah, exactly. And then the second big question is, if risk isn't the whole story, then what else is determining the rate of return in the market? If it's not just about risk, then what other forces are shaping those returns? That's a question that probably has a lot of economists scratching their heads. I mean, we've been so focused on risk for so long that it's hard to even imagine other explanations. It's a real shift in thinking, that's for sure. But it's also super exciting, you know? It opens up this whole new world of possibilities for understanding how the market really works. Well, you've definitely given us a lot to chew on today. This paper, it challenges so much of what we thought we knew about the stock market. And honestly, it raises more questions than it answers. But I think that's what makes it so fascinating, so important. I couldn't agree more. It's a great reminder that the financial markets are incredibly complex and dynamic, and that human behavior well, it plays a much bigger role than we might have realized. Absolutely. So on that note, I think we'll wrap up our deep dive into finance without exotic risk. We've explored some really challenging ideas today, and hopefully you, the listener, have come away with a new perspective on how powerful expectations can be in the stock market. Until next time, keep those minds engaged and keep those questions coming. 